So today's topic is care of the postpartum family. Um, it'll be split into four videos, but one of them is the postpartum assessment video, which you have already hopefully viewed. If not, or if you need a refresher, I will post a link to that on Canvas. Um, postpartum nursing care involves the whole family, but for the most part, we'll be talking about the needs of the postpartum patient, meaning the woman who has given birth. So we'll start with physiological changes in postpartum. This is probably the driest and most abstract of the content. So grab yourself a snack um, and we'll kind of go through it, but you need it for context um, to understand how interventions work and how your education is gonna be important. So every system in the body has to go back to normal. We saw in pregnancy how every system underwent massive change um, to accommodate this baby over a period of nine months. Now it has to go back to normal in four to six weeks. So we start with uterine involution and that's probably um, the most popular graphic. You see this in every textbook, this here. So basically after the mom has given birth, the fundus shrinks down, pushes out the placenta and goes to about the level of the belly button, the umbilicus. And that's where it is all day long for the day of delivery. One day later, it's finger breath down. The next day, another finger breath, another finger breath. Until about day 10, it's back in the pelvis. You can't feel it anymore. If it goes in reverse, or if it's higher than we expect, we worry about subinvolution, which means that the process isn't happening the way it should be. And the reason we need the uterus to get smaller, other than the fact that it has to fit back in the pelvis because she's not pregnant anymore, um, is that this is the way the body keeps from bleeding after delivery. Um, the placenta, site where it's detached is like an open wound. And in order to keep mom from hemorrhaging, the uterus contracts firmly um, to about that level, to about the level of the belly button and puts pressure on all those blood vessels. And that keeps it from scarring as well, because we don't want to have platelet aggregation and scar formation. So that direct pressure is really important. <clears throat> and we can teach mom this. Um, that her uterus is going to get smaller every day. By about day 10, she shouldn't feel it anymore. Um, the cervix goes back to normal. It's still open for about a week. Um, it'll be one to two centimeters dilated until about that time, and then it'll close. But the shape of the opening, the os, is permanently changed. It goes from being a nice, neat little slit to, they say it's a stellate. I'm not going to show you a picture. Um, but if you were to look at a cervix that has given birth on a uh, like a speculum exam, you would see like a star shaped pattern where it kind of opened up and then had to pull itself back together. It takes about four to six weeks for the healing process to be completely um, done. And that's important for mom to know. And when we talk about risk for infection and um, risk for bleeding, we'll kind of explore that a little bit more, but it does take about four to six weeks to go back to non-pregnant. Pre-pregnant is pretty much gone forever. Um, and your native diagnoses for that, if the process does not go swimmingly, is risk for bleeding or infection. So physiological changes in postpartum, we're still talking about the reproductive system. The endometrium or the lining of the uterus has to heal and it heals by exfoliation and not by creating scar tissue um, because that would jeopardize other pregnancies. And I just wanna call your attention. This is a standard dinner plate. If you're confused, go get a dinner plate or a paper plate. That is the size of the wound. It's not a deep wound, but it has a lot of little vessels that are bleeding. Um, and so it's really important that mom gets rest and that we encourage uterine um, contractions to keep putting pressure on that wound. Um, and it's also important for mom to, re to realize <clears throat> that the bleeding will be heavy for the first day or two, um, and it will get a little bit lighter. It starts out rubra is the bright red discharge. That's also in your assessment video. Serosa is a pinkish or brownish, sort of like when women get periods, it starts out bright red and heavy, and then it kind of goes to a pinkish or brownish tinge. And then we have lochia alba at the end. Lochia alba is like a white or creamyish discharge. Um, and that's just all the leftover debris kind of coming out. At this point, mom is at risk for infection. That's why we teach her no sex for the first six weeks, nothing in the vagina at all. Um, we have to give that endometrium a chance to heal. Okay, so the hormones also have to go back to normal. We heard all about hormones in pregnancy and how they escalate to help grow this human. Um, 
estrogen and progesterone were hormones that were really important in maintaining a pregnancy and growing all the structures um, necessary for that. And now they're going to decrease sharply with the delivery of the placenta. And that allows oxytocin and prolactin to increase. Um, and those two hormones are important not only for breastfeeding, um, but also for, well, oxytocin for contracting the uterus. And they're also um, shown to be effective in promoting feelings of maternal attachment and bonding. Um, other hormones that are affected by delivery, insulin, um, your insulin resistance, that human placental lactogen, that opposed insulin, once you don't have a placenta anymore, um, you don't have that HPL antagonist. So insulin's more effective in the body and we can decrease the levels of insulin. Um, cortisol is decreased in growth hormones. It all returns to normal. The thyroid returns to normal a little more slowly and brings the metabolic rate back to baseline. Some women have issues with the thyroid um, postpartum. And that's something, um, you know, that, that they would have to discuss with their provider. Okay, so changes to other reproductive structures, the vagina, the perineum, labia, all loose tone. They've all been stretched out by, you know, roughly a seven and a half pound baby. It takes them about four to six weeks to return to normal. Whether the perineum was intact or the vagina was intact, maybe you had lacerations or an episiotomy, it's still going to take that four to six weeks to heal. Even if it was uh, not injured, there was trauma edema at this time is common um, and it's something we can help the woman with using ice and uh, topicals things like that cesarean now most of the time the vagina and those structures will still be intact if she never got the second stage but keep in mind that some cesareans are performed for failure to descend or for failed vacuums. And the woman may have pushed for two or three hours, or she may have had a medial lateral episiotomy. Sometimes people forget um, with these patients to assess the perineum, it's still important. The breasts change during pregnancy and after, and the breast is not fully developed until it's nursed a baby. So I'm gonna show you. We have the non-pregnant breast, and most of the structures after puberty are halfway developed. Um, until the woman gets pregnant for the first time, the breast starts to develop. We see more glandular tissue. We see more blood flow to the area. You see the veins sometimes are a little bit more prominent. The areolas get dark. And then in the breastfeeding breast, the lactating breast, that's when the breast fully matures. Um, at first, we only have colostrum produced. And then three to five days when those hormones, when prolactin has had a chance to rise and have its effect on the body, you'll start to see the production of mature milk. And that's when you'll see the breast kind of get very full, very heavy. Um, all this glandular tissue should be very well developed. Um, there's more blood flow to the area. You'll see the superficial veins are much more prominent. Um, and prolactin is important. Some women have problems producing prolactin. Um, and there are some things we can do to help them. But that's kind of getting ahead of where we are. Okay. The other system that undergoes a lot of change all of a sudden is the cardiovascular system. Remember that we've had 50 to 60% increase in blood volume. With delivery, vaginal delivery, you usually see between 200 and 500 milliliters in blood loss. With a C-section, it could be 500 to 1,000. There's also a big fluid shift because you're losing all of the amniotic fluid. Um, additionally, you're losing the placenta, you're losing the baby, and there's like a massive decrease in pressure um, that happens there. So it's a big time of change. And if a woman is already experiencing cardiovascular issues, this could be a time for cardiac instability. Um, most of us are kind of built for it. Remember I said pregnancy is a wellness process, but it's also something of an extreme sport. Cardiac output will remain elevated for 24 to 48 hours. Um, so we have to be mindful of assessing the woman for vital signs. Um, in the beginning, we're going to check at least every 15 minutes for the first two, one or two hours. And then it's going to go to protocol. Some places suggest every 30 minutes for another hour and then an hour once during the next hour and then every eight. Some places it's every 15 minutes, then every hour, then every four hours, then every eight. Um, but you're gonna go by your protocol. The biggest thing that you have to remember is that the first hour after birth is the most dangerous for women. 
um, both hemodynamically and in terms of blood loss. So we need to assess them frequently at that time. Um, blood pressure should go back to baseline. Um, oxygen saturation should still be in that 95 to 100% range. Temperature should still be normal, should still be lower than 100.3. Hopefully it's lower even than that. Um, but heart rate and respirations are going to decrease. And sometimes you'll see a little bit of bradycardia right after delivery. Remember, we had that 10 to 15 beats per minute increase with pregnancy. Now with that fluid shift, we're going to see a decrease um, in the heart rate. A normal change that's associated with all of this uh, fluid shift is called postpartum chills. And it's shaking after delivery. And if you've been in delivery, you may have seen this woman just starts shaking uncontrollably. And it's kind of a normal thing, but it's kind of freaky if you're not expecting it. Um, the nurse can help by giving mom a warm blanket um, and just reassuring her that it's normal. Okay, in terms of the neurological system, mostly, you know, there's not a lot of change, um, but things that the nurse needs to be aware of. If there was an epidural in progress, you're going to turn it off right after delivery, and it's going to take a little while to wear off. Could take one to two hours, depends on how uh, powerful that epidural was, sometimes it takes three or four hours. So the patient is still at risk for falls because they have decreased motor sensation and uh, decreased motor um, abilities and decreased sensation. Um, so when you get them up for the first time, you need to test their muscle strength. You need to um, test their sensation, make sure their feet can feel the floor and test their muscle strength. Um, don't try to ambulate them if they are still numb from their epidural because you're going to be picking them up off the floor and doing a whole lot of paperwork. Um, another thing to be aware of, it's not uncommon for women to get headaches postpartum um, from fatigue and positioning during breastfeeding and from um, sometimes hunger because they've been NPO for so long or unclear liquids for so long. Um, but it's very important to assess the character, onset, duration, um, and severity of a headache because sometimes preeclampsia comes back. Um, and I'll just make a note about the spinal headache. Um, an epidural needle is wider or it's a, it's a bigger gauge than a spinal needle. And that epidural space, as I mentioned during that video, um, is pretty small. So when they're inserting it, even under perfect conditions, mom is positioned perfectly and she stays perfectly still. There's always the risk that you're going to go through the epidural space and puncture a little hole in the dura and some cerebrospinal fluid will leak out. Now, this isn't an emergency per se, um, but the mom can get a really bad headache from this. And the key to a post-epidural, what makes it like your assessment significant, if mom is laying flat and the headache goes away and then she sits up and it comes back and it's excruciating when she's sitting straight up. That's a pretty clear indication that what she's got is a spinal headache. Um, and there are some things that we can do for that. But just be aware when you're doing your assessment. Um, if the mom complains of a headache, you're going to do a lot more assessment. Now, if it's headache, blurred vision, and high blood pressure, then that's a whole different um, ball of wax. And that's more emergent. And that would require a lot of intervention. Um, you would want to get labs and call your provider and give us more on that. Okay, so the urinary system also undergoes change and tries to get back to normal. Now the bladder is hormone sensitive and it may have decreased tone. There may have been some injury from pushing against a full bladder. There might be some periurethral trauma from the delivery if mom tore sort of upwards instead of downwards. Um, and Pitocin can lead to urinary retention. So we have this risk of urinary retention. That's why when we do our bubble check, we're checking the bladder. Can they void? You're going to measure the first two or three times they void, depending on your protocol, and make sure that they're not just dribbling out like 50 mLs of overflow, um, but that they really are emptying their bladder. <clears throat> if you have a full bladder, it will knock the uterus out of that nicely contracted position, and you are at risk for hemorrhage. So you need to make sure that mom... Um, is able to void. In the next few days, she's going to have increased diuresis. She's going to pee a whole lot to get rid of all the extra fluid. Um, but she's also at increased risk for UTI for a few reasons. Number one, catheterizations are more common in labor and delivery with the epidural placement. You might be doing straight cats or a Foley. Um, if it's a C-section, she might have had that. But there's also all the trauma to that area, and sometimes that disrupts the normal flora. 
So mom is at increased risk for UTI. Um, the GI system also goes back to normal. In the beginning, you have increased appetite. Mom might be starving right after delivery. She hasn't eaten. And also now she doesn't have, you know, the baby taking up all the space. At the end of pregnancy, a lot of women do report a slightly decreased appetite. Um, because of the hormonal influence and because of, you know, pushing, um, she's at risk for constipation and hemorrhoids. Um, and there are some things that we do for that. Surgical patients also have the added risk factor of anesthesia and manipulation of the bowel. So they really are at risk for decreased peristalsis and constipation. Musculoskeletal system, um, it's very common after delivery for women to complain of aches and pains in their arms, their shoulders, their back, their legs. And that's all from different positions and the effort of pushing. Um, there's also a condition called diastasis recti or diastasis recti abdominis, and it's this. There's like a linea, linea alba right here. Um, it's like a ligament that holds these muscles together. And with the distension of the uterus, um, sometimes those muscles get separated. Sometimes you'll be doing a fundal check and like almost feel the, like that your hand can go all the way in and it can um, because these muscles are separated. It usually goes back to normal in a few months, but they really shouldn't be doing any crunches, any um, abdominal exercises without checking with their physician um, because they can make that separation worse. And you can get like a hernia, umbilical hernia or something like that if the abdominal wall is really weak. Okay, the immune system. So this isn't really a change per se, but it's just considerations that you should have postpartum. RH negative mothers should receive the ROGAM within 72 hours of birth if the baby is RH positive. There's ROGAM right there. The other brand name, Rofilac, there's probably a few of them, but they should get that within 72 hours of birth to prevent the formation of antibodies against the next baby. If they are not immune to rubella or they are equivocal, which means that they got the immunization they have some antibodies, but not enough, they should receive the MMR vaccine. That's given subcutaneously. Some of you may have done that in clinical already. Tdap is another vaccine that we can offer mom postpartum. Typically now they offer it during pregnancy to give baby passive antibodies. But if she didn't have it, we offer it now because pertussis is lethal to newborns. And if mom doesn't get it, she can't give it. The baby is still too young to get the Tdap. They won't receive that vaccination for about two months. We can offer the influenza vaccine as well and the pneumonia vaccine. Um, if it's flu season and they haven't previously gotten it, pneumonia vaccine, there's certain candidates for that. I'm not gonna worry about it, but you will see that in clinical. And that is the end of postpartum changes.